Hello friends and foes of Middle-earth and welcome back. So, The Rings of Power Episode 6. It wasn't as boring as the other episodes, but it was equally painful to get through. As usual, there's little to no logic. People fly around the world, a ton of bad dialogue. But in this episode, I also noticed a ton of stuff was stolen from the Peter Jackson films. And normally I wouldn't mind a thing or two being reused, but the sheer amount in this episode was ridiculous and really made it come across as a fan film. So in this episode, I will also compare a lot of stuff to the Peter Jackson films. So let's jump right into it and review episode 6. We start off in Mordor with Adar. He plants some Alpharin seeds before a battle, which is apparently an elf thing. It's not something I mind too much. Then he goes on and gives a speech to his orcs. So he says the orcs have walked from Ered Mithrin to Ethel Arnen. So the Grey Mountains to Emun Arnen, I assume. Ethel Arnen is not something from the law, but I assume it alludes to what would be Gondor. Some people have theorized that the skin the orcs are wearing is dragon skin. And if they indeed came from the Grey Mountains, that would at least make sense, as the Withered Heath was known as a breeding ground for dragons. So they march towards the Watchtower and sing a marching song. It sounds a lot like something from the Lord of the Rings films, a bit like the troll drumming as the orcs approach Minas Tirith. Accompanying Adar, we also have Waldrick, this guy. That will play a key part later in the episode. But as Adar and the orcs go through the gate, they notice that none of the villagers are there. <sighs> It's so dumb, but we will get back to that. But yes, you guessed it. Rondia didn't leave and he's going to fight all the orcs on his own. Adar sees the statue with the key, and then Waldrake asks what happened to Sauron. But we will first get an answer to that later on. Then Rondia suddenly decides to attack and go full legal ass on them. He picks up an arrow, sets fire to it, and shoots at the rope on the tower. And apparently that's all it took to make the tower collapse. Then Rondia blocks the gate, and we see the tower fall down on them. And then to the really dumb stuff. All the villagers somehow came down from the watchtower to this field. How? Well, there's only one path leading to the watchtower, so it becomes painfully obvious. What's not obvious is why none of the orcs decided to keep watch and notice all the villagers fled. It makes absolutely no sense. The writing is so bad already, and this is like six minutes into the episode. A normal person would likely see this as a chance to escape Mordor, but apparently all of the villagers wants to stay and fight in the village. And then we go to the Numenorean ships, all three of them. Yeah, there's 500 soldiers plus horses in these three ships. Keep that in mind. Isildur doesn't mind sharing an apple with his horse. Okay then. But instead of giving the rest of the apple to the horse, he just throws it overboard. What a waste of resources. Then Isildur gets to talk with Galadriel for the first time. He's as insufferable as always, but it's without doubt one of her better moments. Keen are the eyes of the elves. This is a line by Aragorn in the Two Towers about Legolas. Elendil shows up and Galadriel asks what happened to Isildur's mother. And then we get some really awkward dialogue, followed up with an overdramatic answer. And as Elendil and Muriel talk, we see this map. Apparently written in Adunaic, which makes perfect sense. I got no clue what this is supposed to be, but this is Palladia. So they want me to believe that Numenor is an isolated kingdom, and yet they have built Palladia and apparently other cities in what would become Gondor. Anyway, they plan to sail off the Anduin, cross the Shadow Mountains, and then help out the villages of Tiharat. Keep that in mind, because we don't actually see them go through the Vale. I'm fairly certain they refer to the Vale that would later be known as Morgul Vale. And then they would have used the path of Kirit Ungol. It's worth keeping in mind that the stairway Frodo and Sam uses is not the official way through the pass. The real pass was between the tower of Kirit Ungol and Minas Morgul, a pass that also played a key part when Sauron attacked Gondor and started the War of the Last Alliance. Something that would be cool to get an introduction to now, but nope. This could have been a fine way to include Shilob into the story, something they actually got the rights for. Arondia tries to break the broken sword, yeah, and it's not working. And then we get this first rib off. I didn't even catch it in the first viewing. Notice the dialogue. Then let's compare it to Elrond's in The Lord of the Rings. It's a bit of a weak reference, but it's only one out of a whole ocean. Anyway, Arondia decides to hide the broken sword so nobody can find it. But of course, someone will. The villagers prepare for battle, and apparently the village is an advantage. Ah, <sighs> come on. No, it's not. You had a perfect watchtower. Look, you could have destroyed any of these three bridges. 
all of them if you wanted. And you could have thrown down rocks or been shooting arrows as the orcs approached. No, that was too intelligent. No, instead, all the orcs have to cross this bridge. The best defense in the history of Middle Earth. It's so tiny that the orcs don't even need the bridge. Why is it even there? Is there a puddle or something? Waste of resources. But I guess that fits well with the show, which is also a waste of resources. And all those who can't fight will be locked up inside the tavern. Which the orcs could simply burn down, but yeah, that's also too smart. It's not like they're carrying torches or anything, is it? This, of course, is also very much like the women and children hiding inside the glittering caves during the Battle of Helm's Deep. And apparently an old tavern now equals a keep. Yeah. And then Arondia tries to give some encouraging words. It doesn't really work. And it also sounds a lot like Theoden when he talks about how no enemy has ever set foot inside the Hornburg. I mean, we even get the sunset reference that is also used in the Battle of Helm's Deep. By the way, notice how they changed women to wounded. Clever, clever. Anyway, Theo wants to fight, but he is not allowed to. Instead, he is meant to protect the wounded and children. You know, just like Eowyn wants to fight, but is told to protect the women and children inside the glittering caves. Don't come and tell me this episode is not a total rip-off of the Battle of Helm's Deep. It was painfully obvious to me right away. Theo gets a spear, but it doesn't matter because he will never use it. And then from one stolen scene to the next. Theo asks his mom to say a line she used to tell him when he was little. And the dialogue is stolen from Sam in The Return of the King. It's there to a minor degree in the films, twice. But the actual line in The Return of the King is very similar to what's used. And fair enough, they use stuff from the books. But it's probably one of the most famous of his lines, at least among Tolkien nerds. They end the quote differently though, but it's not very good. What does it even mean? Anyway, let's try and move on. Arondia vaguely referenced to Yavanna. That's a nice touch, but technically she's not a Valor, but a Valier. So it's a nice try, but you're a little off again, as always. And finally we get a love story worse than Twilight. During the night, the orcs finally decide to attack. Arondia stands on top of the roof, and it reminds a little of how Theoden stands with his men in the Hornburg before the battle begins. Who is this guy? And oh no, we see the terrified villagers as the orcs approaches, just like we see it during the Battle of Helm's Deep. Surprise, surprise. Even the sound and music sounds a lot like the Battle of Helm's Deep. Feel free to compare it yourself, I'm not gonna risk it. Okay, so the orcs decided to bring a battering ram with them. So they know they are inside the village, and they probably expect them to hide inside the tavern or somewhere else. Why else would they bring it? But what doesn't make sense is how surprised they all are when they get attacked by the villagers. That makes no sense. Ronwyn sends a burning car towards the orcs. No, no, they're trying to trap the orcs. Oh, that was easy. Except they are not trapped at all. They could just walk right through here, but all right then. And then Arondia and the other archers start shooting the orcs. We also get another wannabe Legolas moment. Some of the orcs shoot back. Thank you for not being completely brain dead. The orcs break free. A random guy from before says they're headed for the tavern. And Arondia pretends to be Legolas again. It's very much like Legolas that tried to kill the uruk about to blow himself up. The battering ram is almost at the door. But then, yes, a bunch of people attack the orcs just as they're about to destroy the door. Oh my god. And they're even mimicking the dust falling from the ceiling. Again. The Glittering Caves reference. And then Arondia gets into a fight with this giant orc. It's honestly not very interesting. We know Arondia won't die anyway, so it just drags on. There's quite a lot of gore in this episode, which many have pointed out is not very Tolkienian. And then the single mother comes and saves him in the last second. The villagers then think they have won, but think again, fools. They realize that they have been fighting the traitors from the village, and they act all surprised. How can this be a surprise to anyone? Now I think the show missed a great opportunity to use some of the magic we know from the lore. Dinrod disguises himself and his companions as orcs until Sauron reveals their true form. That could have been an interesting thing to include and would make it interesting as an orc here would slowly fade into a human, the true form. Orc archers start to lose their arrows on the villagers. Oh no, this guy with the evil cow died. The best side character ever whose name we shall remember for all the many years to come. And then an arrow hits Bronwyn. 
and it's all done in slow motion and starts to remind a lot about the scene from the two towers where Haldir is shot and killed in slow motion as well. Even the music sounds somewhat similar. Everyone to the keep. You know, just like Theoden yells fall back to the keep or Aragorn yelling to the keep in Elvish afterwards. Now the difference here between the two towers and this episode is that there's an actual keep in the two towers. Where here they just call the tavern a keep. I mean, come on. If you're going to steal stuff, then at least do it properly. And then we have a really gory scene where the arrow in Bronwyn gets pulled out. Jeff Bezos wanted Game of Thrones after all. So there you have it. Adar finally arrives to the village as the orcs scream Nampat, which apparently means death in the black speech, at least in this show. They start ramming down the door and then we cut to this. The Numenorean cavalry arriving at dawn. Just like Gandalf and Eomer arrives at dawn in the Jackson film. And it's very much like the Urukai ramming down the doors leading to the keep in the two towers. And I'm baffled how many actually missed all these. Okay, so there's a number of issues here. First, are we honestly meant to believe that all these people were on board three ships plus the horses? I just find that so hard to believe. But alright. And then to the law. The Numenorians didn't actually use cavalry in combat, as we can read in the Unfinished Tales. It's not the worst law issue in this show, but just another thing that directly contradicts the law. The orcs break into the tavern, and Adar just wants the sword. He starts killing random villagers, as Arondia refuses to tell where it's hidden. He has more gory stuff. And again, this little piece of dialogue reminds of Boromir when he speaks about the ring. Such a little thing. He then breaks down, and hand over the sword to Adar. The cavalry approaches, and Adar goes outside and gives a task to Waldrick. Yes, we all know what it is. The Numenorians charge into the village, there's some fight scenes, and overall they look fine, I think. It's not the best, but far from the worst. And compared to the epicness of the Battle of Helm's Deep, this just becomes a bit laughable. Galadriel has another over-the-top action scene. Hardly a surprise. Montamo proves to be useless, but Valandil saves him the last second. Isildur is sent in and we see Elendil fight some orcs. And look at that helmet. It really proves they are way too big. I mean, what is this? As I've said before, he might as well wear a bucket. Elendil gets almost killed by an orc, but Halbrand saves the day with a spear. If he is indeed Sauron, he seems to save his future enemies quite a lot. And then we get this little scene between Elendil and Isildur. At least that connection makes a little sense in the Second Age, so I don't mind it too much here. Galadriel wants to find the commander of the orcs, and we see Adar flee from the fight. Another over the top moment where Galadriel dodges a spear, as Arondi explains to Theo who she is. Uh... Then Helbrand notices Galadriel is chasing after him, and sets off. We get some weird music as Galadriel chases Adar through the woods, and then we get this bit. Galadriel whispering Norolim to her horse. Just like Arwen says the exact same thing to Asphaloth in the Jackson film. And fair enough, that is actually from the books. Though it's actually Glorfindel saying Norolim, Norolim, Asphaloth. Meaning run swift, run swift, Asphaloth. So yeah, another steal. I mean, they even had her ride through the woods like Arwen. Come on. But then something happens. Elrond somehow magically appears in front of them. How on earth are we meant to take that seriously? I mean, I guess he knows the country, but still, it just doesn't make sense. The writing in this show is probably some of the worst I've ever witnessed. And the saddest part is that it's also extremely predictable. Elbrand almost kills Adar, but Galadriel stops him right in time. Then we get this weird piece of dialogue. Eat your tongue. But alright then, it's not as bad as the dialogue we get next. And it's even for the second time. Next we see Galadriel interrogating Adar inside a barn. She is clearly referring to the origin of the orcs being corrupted elves. The origin of the orcs is actually a topic often debated among Tolkien scholars, as Tolkien changed his mind about the origin a number of times over the years, and some people even think he never settled on anything. But Christopher Tolkien actually wrote the following in Morgoth's Ring. This then, as it may appear, was my father's final view of the question. Orcs were bred from men, and if the conception in mind of the orcs may go far back into the night of Melkor's thought, it was Sauron who, during the ages of Melkor's captivity in Amman, brought into the being the black armies 
that were available to his master when he returned. So the idea of corrupted elves was actually discarded by Tolkien later on. But it's not something I mind too much, to be honest. But still wrong. Something that really bothers me though, is the amount of weird angles in this scene. And I know they want to create discomfort, but to me it just came across as annoying and a weak attempt of being artistic. Anyway, Galadriel guesses that Adar is one of the first corrupted elves. The Moriondor, she calls them. It's not a term from the law, at least to my knowledge, and I'm no expert on Tolkien's languages, but when I saw the name, I was very confused. Mori means dark, and Morion actually means son of the dark, which also works in plural form. But why add the Endor at the end then, meaning land? That changes the meaning to the land of the dark sun, or land of the dark suns. Maybe I'm wrong, but it struck out to me right away. Oh, and Adar doesn't like being called an orc, but prefer Uruk. And true enough, Uruk actually just means orc in black speech, so um, it means the same kind of thing, but just a different language. But all right then. Then Adar goes on and tells us that after the defeat of Morgoth, Sauron devoted himself to healing Middle-earth. A bit of a stretch, but yes, he did repent his evil deeds to Ionwe, the herald of Manwe. But Sauron would not face the judgment of the Valar and fled. And soon hereafter, he returned to evil. It's an interesting little reference, but there's not much context given here, so it just comes across as a lie. Then Adar explains he sought to craft a power not of the flesh, but over flesh. Which sounds a lot like what the ring will eventually become. A power of the unseen world, as Adar calls it. Another fine little reference to the unseen world, we know mostly from the books, but which is also what we see whenever Frodo wears the ring. As Adar goes on, we see the fortress from the first episode again. Many have theorized this might be Utumnu, the old fortress of Morgoth, but it's actually confirmed not to be that because of right issues, allegedly. It would have made sense though, as the episode is called Udun, another name for the fortress. But it's also a name for the stretch of land in northern Mordor. Others have pointed out that Gandalf calls the Balrog the Flame of Udun. However, Udun actually means dark pit, depth, underworld, or hill. So I think that makes more sense, as that refers to what we will later see in the episode, beneath Mount Doom, but we will get back to that. Next, Adar tells that he in fact killed Sauron, which of course must be a lie, unless they're going to abandon the last bit of lore this show might actually include. Galadriel reveals her dark side once again, and Adar has a pretty good comeback, probably one of the best thing in this episode. Were the orcs completely irredeemable? Well, it was a concept even Tolkien struggled with. So it's interesting the show brings it up, but I must admit I'm worried where they will go with it, especially after the article about female orcs. Halbrand shows up right as Galadriel is about to kill Adar. Galadriel leaves, and Adar asks who Halbrand is, but we never get an answer. Just one of many things that seem to indicate that Halbrand is indeed Sauron. I really hope that's not true, but honestly, I no longer care for this show. To call this a Tolkien adaptation is a disgrace. Next we see Galadriel and Halbrand sit and talk. And then we get even more dialogue that just totally confirms that he is indeed Sauron. It just becomes more and more obvious. And then we cut to the villagers and soldiers celebrating. Yeah. They wept when they had to kill the traitors from the village, but when the other villagers died, they decided to celebrate. Are we meant to believe that? Yeah, my entire family just died, but let's celebrate. What? I mean, come on. Come on. And then we get a girl boss moment. The sort of stuff that makes you want to jump into Mount Doom. And then all it takes to become king of the Southlands is a sigil and a pouch. And no one questions it. But just hail him as the new king. Imagine if he actually stole it like he said in an earlier episode. Now that would be a little interesting at least. The prince who was promised. Are they capable of making anything original themselves? What a kingdom he has. One village, which is barely a village, and a ruined watchtower. The greatest king in the history of Middle-earth. Theo is not too happy about parting with the sword, so maybe he will become an Arskull after all. We'll see. Or probably not. I'm not going to watch season 2. Then we get some more dialogue that sounds a lot like Sam's words in The Return of the King. But oh no, it's not the sword. It's a hatchet. Dun dun dun. And nobody noticed the whole time. Great. 
And then we got to Waldrick. He plants the sword key thing, whatever it is, and release the river or lake or whatever that is. If we compare some of these shots to the two towers, it becomes obvious again it's stolen. Sorry, inspired by. Then we got to Sildo and Elendil and their horse Beric. We finally hear Numenor being referred to as Westerness. Minor stuff, but good at least. There's a bit of dynamic between them, and I think it's one of the better moments in this episode, and one of the only things I'm just slightly more curious to see more about. And then the pressure in the orc tunnels makes the water burst out. And the orc tunnels are not created for the orcs, but the river. If the orcs wanted to be in the shade of the sun, why did they cut down the trees by the way? Doesn't make a lot of sense, but alright. Then we see the water flows to a chasm beneath Orotruin, aka Mount Doom. It looks pretty good at least. For some unknown reason, the water makes the entire thing go nuclear. My bet is that mentors were involved. Mount Doom erupts for the first time, I guess. Though in the lore it's theorized that the land was called Mordor because of the eruptions, even before Sauron decided to settle there, around 1000 in the Second Age. Mount Doom was actually created by Morgoth, as we can read in the peoples of Middle-earth. Oh my goodness. Now this is a bit of a vague comparison, but the orcs just used a secret weapon to make something explode, or erupt in this case. Just like the Urukai brings a secret weapon that also explodes. A weak reference perhaps, but I thought it should be mentioned. Now this sort of eruption is called pyroclastic flow, and it's not the sort of thing you want to see yourself, as you're not going to survive it. But guess who is? Because of course. It would surprise me if anyone important actually died. Maybe on Tamo, but he's not actually important. Adar managed to escape in time. I'm not sure how, but I guess we will never know. And the episode ends with Galadriel being badass. <sighs> Let's hand out some points. Story. 3 out of 10. So this was without doubt one of the better episodes. Which is really sad to say, but it was. It was nice not to get interrupted by the Halfords at least, but despite all that, I think there were a ton of bad writing in this episode. Entire groups of people just teleporting around, either through mountains or away from a besieged watchtower. Also Halbrand teleporting in front of Adar. Likewise, I think the whole idea of activating Mount Doom was sort of ridiculous and also law inaccurate. Law. 3 out of 10. Now that's a very, very generous three. None of what we saw in this episode actually happens in any of Tolkien's books. So that alone should grant it another negative one. But if we try to ignore that and focus on the actual lore stuff used in this episode, it was without doubt one of the better ones. Still far from what I would consider good. It was interesting to get some origin story for the orcs, though a bit outdated, but fair enough. The reference to Sauron's past was also a nice touch. Despite the dialogue taken both from the books and the films, I think it was better than to listen to more of the cringe dialogue. As mentioned, I think there were some lore elements that could have been used, but wasn't. Cinematography. 2.5 out of 10. Okay, so I have to give the cinematography a very low score. The amount of weird angles in this episode really bothered me and made it harder to actually watch. It went on and on for several minutes and felt both forced and unnecessary at times. And besides that, I felt they took a little too many ideas from Peter Jackson's adaptations, especially the two towers. Visuals. 5 out of 10. So for the visuals, I think there were some really good looking stuff, like the chasm and Mount Doom erupting. I like those parts and think they were well made. But the filming location of the village just fell off to me for some reason. It's hard to put my finger on it, but it looked very much like a filming set and not an actual village like the bridge being built for no reason, and it just made the whole fight scene seem even more ridiculous. Dialogue. 3.5 out of 10. The dialogue have been worse in previous episodes. We even got some of the bad ones a second time. I still feel there were a few decent lines here and there, like Adar's comeback, but it's still not something I'll remember for years to come. Likewise, some of the best dialogue actually came from Tolkien himself, and then they added new stuff to it, so it just made less sense. <sighs> acting. 4 out of 10. The acting wasn't too impressive, nor totally awful. It was a lot of fighting, so it's a bit hard to be bad at screaming, I guess. Galadriel is still very emotionless. I liked Adal the most, 
and I can totally understand why anyone would sympathize with him. Isildur and Elendil was also fine. Halbrand wasn't too bad either. I feel some of the orcs were acting too much. But maybe that's just me. The scared villagers inside the tavern being really scared made me shake my head. So it was a mixed experience again. Costumes, 2.5 out of 10. Again, the bucket helmets of the Numenorians really bothered me. Also, their armor really looks like costumes and not believable armor. I still think the orcs themselves looked fine, but the dragon skin costumes is not something I'm a fan of. Music and sounds. 3 out of 10. I have to give the music in this episode a rather low score. Many of the chants and sounds from the orcs just made me think of Peter Jackson's films, and it felt like a rip-off to me. I'm sure many others didn't catch that, which is totally fine. But it's something that bothered me greatly almost every time we heard them march. I also think some of the music in this episode was off, especially hunting Ada through the woods. So what's my final score? Well, overall, I think the episode looked fine in many ways, but it also felt incredibly hollow, and the teleporting around bothers me a lot. It was nice to see them include a good chunk of lore for once, even if it missed its mark at times. I think it deserved a 3.5 out of 10. It's fairly generous. I think the episode could have gained a 5, or maybe even a 6, if they improved upon the story elements, and didn't steal all that stuff from Peter Jackson's adaptations. I feel especially those copied elements really made the whole episode come across as a pathetic attempt to be a new, epic Battle of the Helm's Deep. Perhaps I'm one of the few that saw those copied elements, but it dragged down the episode a lot for me. But what do you guys think? What score does episode 6 deserve? And did you learn any new lore from this video? Let me know in the comments. In the opening of The Lord of the Rings, have you ever noticed Sauron is wielding a dagger? Maybe you wonder why. If so, you should watch this video next. As always, thank you all so much for watching. Feel free to leave a like and subscribe. Farewell till next time.